welcome to another Rotary Club of Livermore. All right, so I'm going to ask uh, Marty, would you be willing to lead us in the pledge? I ask everybody else to put yourselves on mute. I do. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Marty. Hey. So up next, I think we have Michael. Let's I don't know. Well, I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay. And because we have, we're talking about money today, we decided we'd do a song about money. Okay. So let's see. Now, what do I do? Share my screen. And there we go. You can see words and music. Say yes. You can yes. See okay. Yes. Go, I think. One, two, three. Three. The best things in life are free, but you can keep them for the birds and bees. Now give me money. That's what I want. That's what I want. What I want. That's what I want. What I want. That's what I want. Oh yeah, that's what I want. Your loving gives me a thrill, but your loving don't pay my bills. Now give me money. What I want, that's what I want. That's what I want, that's what I want. Oh, yeah, that's what I want. Get everything it's true, but what it don't get, I can't use. Now give me money. That's what I want. 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 Oh yeah, that's what I want. Thank you very much, Michael and Stu. And you're always so creative yeah, with that. How do I stop the share though? Yeah, so we'll have Michael stop sharing his screen. I am. I'm locked up for some reason. I might have to log out and come back in. I'm totally locked. So let me try this. Oh, I'm gonna have to get out of this and then come back. So I'll see you guys in a few, okay? Okay, right. bye Michael. Let's see. Ah, he seems to have hung me up too. Yeah, he's still sharing his screen. Hey, Jeff, can uh, you kick him off? Yeah, it's something more going on with Zoom than it is us. Stop sharing. Well, well while we're trying to do that, um, we can put it in speaker mode. Well, there we go. All right, so up next then, we're waiting for, um, Alan, do you have control back? I think so. There we go. All right. So yeah, up that next. Was yeah, it was a uh, Zoom problem. Yep. Up next, uh, Will Bateson. For I'm here. Thought for the day. All right. So last week was Thanksgiving, as we all know. It's a unique holiday in America and Canada, actually. Thanksgiving is literally a holiday to celebrate gratitude. And living a life of gratitude has been one of the pillars of my life. In this most trying of years, we still have much to be grateful for. So here are four quotes about gratitude. Let us remember that as much has been given us, much will be expected from us. And that true homage comes from the heart as well as the lips and shows itself in deeds. Theodore Roosevelt. JFK said, we must find time to stop and thank the people who make differences in our lives. 
I am thankful to be a part of such an amazing group of Rotarians. When asked if my cup is half full or half empty, my only response is that I am thankful that I have a cup. Sam Le Lefkowitz. And lastly, not, not what we say about our blessings, but how we use them is the true measure of thanksgiving. W.T. Perkiser. And I will finish by saying I will practice what I will preach and I will join the President's Club. Thank you, Rotarians. Well, thank you very much uh, for those, that wonderful reminder of gratitude and also for joining the President's Club. So our meeting front line, uh, Jeff Youngsma is our Zoom host, Steve Neff, Neff, sorry, Steve, all the way from Florida is our Spur reporter. Alan's doing our AV. Kathy will publish the Spur. Sheila wasn't able to join us today. And um, David Rounds is monitoring our chat. So do we have any visiting, Rotarian, visiting Rotarians today? I did not see any. Uh, but we're glad to have Jacob Reed with us here today. I'm glad you were able to make it, Jacob, and then also to have Tom Vargas with us from Idaho. Uh, any guests? Okay, I did not see any. Uh, we often have, I didn't see if Daniel's here with us. Yeah, Daniel Pryor's here with okay. us as a guest. Welcome, Daniel. <laughs> Any Hello, other guests today? All right, so just welcome to all of you. So another photo from my- uh, Carolyn, how should we read your map? Oh, what you should read my map and that anywhere there's a blue line is where I walked. And then where you see the darker red, that's uh, I walk those streets more frequently. It's kind of like, you know, the COVID maps. Um, and because that's my own neighborhood. So you can see that those are all of the streets within the city limits of Livermore and I walked every single one of them. All right, and so we've heard a lot about and we're gonna see if some more photos today about Sunflower Hill, but this is just one of the streets I walked by all, um, all of, was it Olivina on Hageman Ranch and um, that it's actually owned by the city of Livermore. So you can see who else is, operates there off, off of Hageman Ranch. So we are going to do a recognition of October and November birthdays. It's only December 2nd, but we are catching up. All right, Alan. Yeah, that got knocked off the air for some reason. There it goes.
Thank you very much, Alan. That was wonderfully done. And happy birthday and happy anniversary to everybody who celebrated in October and November. Uh, and up next, we are going to have a member talk from Alan Frank. Alan, take it away. Okay, I'm glad to talk to everyone today. I think my sense of humor was bestowed upon me on the day of my birth during World War II. That day in the European theater and in my family's, uh, in my family's, uh, see, I can't read my own handwriting. That day in my family was the turning point in the Battle of the Bulge. I grew up in New York City in the Bronx and spent summers at a cabin in the woods near a lake north of the city. I could sing before I could walk. I started formal music lessons while in kindergarten. My first piano, then later flute, but always with ensemble and singing classes. I also got my first locomotive cab ride on a steam locomotive at age five. My dad, a war vet, was a successful civil engineer while several cousins were struggling musicians. My dad taught me carpentry, car mechanics, how to handle a gun, photography, and much more. My parents took me and my brother to concerts and impromptu recitals at relatives' homes. In junior high, I became a radio ham and a member of a ham radio and physics street gang and was the first in our neighborhood to bounce signals off Sputnik. In choosing a high school, I had opportunities for schools with an emphasis on either science or music. My dad advised that I could always make a living in science and keep music as a hobby, but the other way around didn't work so well. So I chose the general high school. I did volunteer work in an experimental lab at Montefiore Hospital. I continued with music classes at the Manhattan School of Music, and I graduated high school with, a letter, with letters in band and orchestra, a science fair win, and a biology scholarship. At age 16, I entered New York University as a pre-med major with a music minor. I was never without a job through college. I worked at the American Museum of Natural History in their micropaleontology lab and operating their planetarium projector. I also played with chamber groups that performed at soirees for the rich and famous on Fifth Avenue. With a girlfriend at that time, I came under the tutelage of her parents a Life magazine photographer and the artistic director of Mercury Records. They expanded my skills in photography and opened doors to me in the New York music scene. After competing with the pre-med fraternity boys that always seemed to get A's without attending classes, my street gang buddies convinced me to switch my major to physics. I subsequently got a job with the Bellevue Medical Center Dermatology Department calibrating both the curative and damaging effects of solar radiation. After six years as an undergraduate, I finally emerged with a BA in both physics and music. By then I was about to be married to a different girl this time. For my wife's health, I needed to leave the lousy New York weather. I accepted a teaching fellowship in the physics program at the University of Denver. After two years facing the Vietnam War draft, I left school with a master's degree and took a protected job at Ball Brothers Research Corp in Boulder, Colorado, where I became the mission scientist for the Orbiting Soul Observatory and pioneered laser alignment techniques for space telescopes. I continued my graduate studies at the University of Colorado and courses in optical design from the University of Rochester. After Nixon lost the Colorado Electoral College vote for his re-election, he took out his peak by canceling all pen, pending federal research contracts in the state. Ball lost the follow on to Oso and I lost my job. By then I had a family to consider and had to weigh the choice of establishing residency at UC with a paltry stipend or moving out of state for a well-paying well -paying job. So I came to Livermore Lab. I was hired as an experimental physicist in the optics and lasers serving the entire laboratory. I invented new ways of doing things and discovered why some experiments failed and some theories were hogwash. 
I also continued my graduate studies this time at Stanford. When the issue of residency to finish the PhD arose, it became the choice of giving up the rest of my life and the support of my family. With published papers, patents, and a growing reputation, the PhD became superfluous. My career at the lab brought me to lecture at conferences and universities around the world and the Edgerton Prize for High Speed Imaging. I retired from the lab when it changed from a nonprofit to a for profit. I felt that research for a profit, especially as it was to be administered, was not in the national interest and would damage the lab environment. Throughout my career, Except for my two years at DU, I was always involved in some major musical activity. In Colorado, I played with the Boulder Philharmonic and the Denver Symphony. In Livermore, I joined the symphony and the Valley Choral Society. Before long, I was playing with the Fremont Philharmonic, singing with the Oakland Symphony Chorus, the California Bach Society, and opera companies around the region. With my experience in, in how musical companies were run, I was able to help found and operate the Livermore Valley Opera. I was invited to join Rotary by a family friend, David Lowell. I retired from the opera company when my tasks became more management than musical and the board was pushing to become a professional company. I stumbled into the Niles Canyon Railroad in the 80s and while rebuilding my photography scale, skills, I became their official photographer curator, conductor, engineer, and eventually their vice president. I moved on to be the historian for the city's project to restore the old railroad depot and wrote a book about its history. Today, I'm the president of the symphony developing programs to keep it alive through this pandemic. My wife and I have been doing art and photography together for over 50 years. My daughter lives with her husband in Scotland and our grandson just entered college and granddaughter is rapidly working her way through high school. My brother took the other path in life and is a professional guitarist living in Davis. Heeding my father's advice, I made my living in physics and never attempted to in music. I realized that although physics was exciting, in my heart, I've always been a musician. Something I've learned through my many interests and associations, volunteers vote with their feet. When I don't get satisfaction from volunteering and it gets to be too much like work, my feet start itching. I've been a member of this Rotary Club for over 25 years and my feet don't itch. Thank you very much, Alan. And we are very grateful and I am especially grateful in my role this year as club president that your feet don't itch and that you continue to do so much for this club. So uh, Brian, I'd like to invite you to give us a quick update on a new uh, polio on polio plus. Okay, I think I'm unmuted, unmuted. So everyone very quickly, uh, some good news, some bad news and some intermediate news. First, the good news. Both polio type two and polio type three are now officially certified as being eliminated from the world. Uh, that means that for 10 years, there've been no, uh, the virus has not been discovered anywhere in those two things. <clears throat> the intermediate news is that polio type one is still uh, active and um, uh, limited just to the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. I don't think that's going to change until the political system there becomes more stable. Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan in particular is doing an enormous effort to try and get rid of it, but it, up in the tribal, uh, wild tribal areas, it's just hasn't been possible to get rid of it. Okay, now for the bad news. There have been 751 new cases of uh, circulating vaccine derived polio. This is 
polio that has come from the vaccine that's been administered has been mutated and so ends up as a paralytic, uh, uh, potentially paralytic disease. These outbreaks have been sporadic, they're chiefly in Africa. Uh, the, all the agencies for the GPEI react dramatically to every time they get an outbreak and try to isolate it, but it's still there. The hopeful news for the future uh, was uh, just announced that there is a, a novel oral polio vaccine type 2 that has now been developed uh, and is ready to be used. Uh, this is an amazing thing, it's being bioengineered to make it uh, resistant to mutation, so it's much more stable. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, even um, many labs, including UCSF, have been involved. This has been a particular advance made possible by Polio Plus and the Gates Foundation. And there's a strong expectation that using this will be finally able to get rid of the circulating um, uh, derived virus causing uh, cases. So that's where we're at. Remember on Jan January 20th, Dr. Andino from uh, UCSF will be talking to us and will be filling us in much more on uh, polio and maybe uh, vaccines in uh, general. That's it, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Brian. And this fits well into uh, a next Pat McMiniman, if you'll give us an update on E-R-E-Y. Thank you, President Carolyn. President Carolyn has asked me to give you an update on the status of our club's progress toward the Rotary Foundation goal that every member of our club will donate $25 or more to the Rotary Foundation's annual fund during this Rotary year. So you'll recall that this goal is known as every Rotarian every year. And Carolyn, I think is the first president in many years, maybe um, in the club's existence to have uh, set this goal for our club. So we're very excited about doing this this year. And as of today, I'm pleased to report that 27 members of our club have already individually donated $25 or more to the Rotary Foundation's annual fund. And President Carolyn and the members of our club's board are very grateful for the generosity of these members. So I'm confident that every member of our club would like to be a part of our effort to achieve the Rotary Foundation goal of every Rotarian every year. And so in a manner similar to what we have done this year with other giving campaigns, I'm asking for 10 members today to use the Zoom chat feature and simply pledge, I will donate $25 to the TRF annual fund. And I realized uh, there's also the option you could unmute and let us know if you pledge uh, that way. So after our meeting, uh, after we uh, hopefully uh, have members pledge, I'll contact uh, each of you and provide information about how you can make your donation easily and I'll help in any way I can uh, to facilitate that. And in the weeks ahead, I plan to share similar updates so everyone can follow along with the great progress we're making on E-R-E-Y or every Rotarian every year. Thank you, President Carolyn. So let's take a look at what's happening in the chat area. Great, Marianne Rosa, better start writing here. Tom Vargas. I'm writing them down, Pat. Don't worry about it. You just read them out. We Great, got it. Thanks. Uh, Christian Chukwuma, I just missed somebody right before Christian. They're going fast. Gordon Jones, Trish. I Monroe. think it was Christina and John Marion. Thank you, Carolyn. 
Hey, Pat, if you want to wait uh, a couple of hours, I'll have this chat uh, downloaded and I will make sure that I email it to you and then you can go through it with a fine tooth comb. I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Jeffrey. You betcha, Pat. That might save you some trouble. Sure. And angst. That sounds great. All right. Thank you very much, uh, fellow Rotarians. And so this is just a reminder um, that next or uh, next week you we are all invited to join the uh rotary club of cupertino for their meeting and ri president holger knack will be the speaker and you can actually submit questions if you'd like but advanced registration is required so there is the registration link there and i believe that david is going to there he did in the chat, you can see that, and it will be in the spur as well. So you're all invited to attend two Rotary meetings next Wednesday at 9 a.m. and then return to ours at between uh, 12 and 12.30. So an update on our uh, lunch money drive fund. And this, you recall, is our goal to where we invited uh, club members, since we're meeting via Zoom and not via lunch, to donate your lunch money. So I'm very um, proud and honored to report that our club members have already contributed over $24,000 to that fund. There have been over 40 club members who have done so. I'm just gonna give a quick uh, readout of first names to thank you all. So that includes Tammy, Keith, Norm, Alan, Bob Cowan, Kathy Coyle, Pat Coyle, uh, Jay, and thank you, Jay, for being our lead donor at $5,000. Stu, Carol, Gordon, Glenn, Manya, Brian, Paul, Ken, Jack, Bill Nebo, Dennis, Ken, Marty, Wendy, David, Mary Ann, Randy, Lynn, Hank, Sonia, who's doing a recurring donation along with a couple other people. You can set that up. Um, Irv, Joel, Mike Thompson, Linda, Jeff, Lee, Ted, Mike Morgan, Kathy Streeter, and Don Wentz. So thank you very much all. And Jim Schmidt said that if I showed everybody how to easily donate, that he'd make sure he'd make a donation. So I am going to right now share my screen and show you how you too can easily donate to the uh, Rotary Club of Livermore's Lunch Money Fund. You simply go to our club's website and you're all seeing our club website right now. If you don't have this bookmark, it's livermore-rotary.org and you simply scroll over here to contribute, click on contribute and up comes our donation page you just simply move down to the lunch money fund, click on the big button, and you'll be taken directly to uh, this landing page. And this is actually recall that this is the Rotarian Foundation of Livermore because these are all uh, charitable contributions and you can donate right here online with a credit card and if you want to make it a monthly donation, then you have to set up a PayPal account, but that's easy to do as well. So that is how you can easily donate online. Um, I'm going to expect that Jim Schmidt will be in that uh, list soon since that's easy to do. But if you'd like to mail your contributions in right here on that same web page gives you the way to uh, send a check in to the club. If you want to send it, if you don't care about the charitable contribution, you can mail the checks directly to our club as well. And then note from this easy page, you can also donate to Polio Plus and then when, and every Rotarian every year. This is your one-stop shopping page for donations for uh, Rotary. So just make sure to check that out and thank you for everybody else who has already donated. So, Alan, uh, back to you. Uh, 
And for time, I'm just going to get go through a quick update here. Just as this is just to show you a few photos from our workday. Uh, remember Sunflower Hill. Uh, Joel already told us about this, but here's some uh, Rotarians in action. And then just to let you know that remember we did, um, Bill Nebo shared that the um, Interact Club at Livermore High School was doing an online fundraiser for Open Heart Kitchen. We helped them achieve their goal of raising a thousand dollars and it was club members who put them over uh, the finish line there. So thank you very much. And this is just a really important shout out to one of our fellow Rotarians. Beth Wilson, I actually get uh, updates from the Alameda County Registrar of Voters uh, sent to me via text. And I know that Alameda County, um, the election is now certified in the county. Um, so there will be some new board members to LARPD. And one of those is because uh, Beth Wilson is stepping down and did not uh, will not be continuing to serve, but Beth served our community for 13 years as a uh, board member for the Livermore Area Recreation and Park District. So thank you very much. That's another example of Rotarians in action. Thank you, Beth, and congratulations for your term there. Uh, next week, Ron Basket from the Tri-Valley Air Quality Community Alliance will be giving us an update on their work in the Tri-Valley. And now I would like to um, ask Paul McCandless to introduce our guest for the day. Paul. Yes, thank you. Um, today I'm very excited to introduce to our speaker and that is uh, Dr. Brian Dombeck. He is the Assistant Professor of Economics at Lewis and Clark University. And he's also a member of the National Economic Education Delegation. This delegation is a group of economists and leaders in the financial world that promote fact-based discourse and evidence-based economic policy. Brian's talk today will be on the impacts of coronavirus on the economy and the efficacy of our country's financial response. Dr. Brombeck joined Lewis and Clark Economics Department in 2017 after receiving his PhD in economics from the University of Oregon. He has given this talk to several Rotary Clubs in the U.S. over the past couple of months and had rave reviews. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brombeck to the Rotary, or Rotary Club of Livermore. Well, thank you very much for that um, extremely kind introduction. And thank you so much for, for having me. It's been a pleasure to be uh, here with you today. I have to say, I've, um, as Alan mentioned, I've, I've done this talk a few times um, in a few different Rotary Clubs, and this is uh, uh, by far the most uh, uh, well put together, well oiled machine. This, this, this meeting just was cooking. So, um, you know, great job to, to all the speakers and the leadership. Um, uh, as Alan said, today what I'm going to be talking about is um, a little bit about the you know, the economy basically uh, so far in the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the, and the resulting recession. And, um, and so really the structure of the talk is I, uh, I hope to sort of briefly bring everybody up to speed on sort of where we are. Um, you know, the news flash is, uh, is that things are not great in general for the economy. Um, I'll, I'll try to give you some sense for uh, where things are um, not so great. And then, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's been done so far in terms of policy responses. And I'll conclude by talking about the um, uh, signs of recovery that we've seen so far. And in particular, I'm gonna focus a little bit on this question of uh, a recovery or a recession for whom. So that, that's sort of the, the, the broad outline. Um, as was mentioned, I'm an I'm a assistant professor of economics. I'm a macroeconomist at uh, Lewis and Clark College. That's in Portland, Oregon. And I'm also a, uh, a, a delegate for uh, NEED for the National Economic Education Delegation. And, uh, and our goal is really just to go out to organizations like Rotary Clubs and Chambers of Commerce and high schools and uh, you know anywhere that people are gathering 
uh, remotely or someday hopefully again in person and uh, and really have a discussion. So I, I'm hoping to, I was told the meeting ends around 1.30, that gives me 25 minutes. That's my plan is to finish on time. Um, and uh, and maybe even a little bit early because what I what I really would like to do is uh, take questions and have a discussion with you. Um, so uh, I should say we have many, many economists with many different specializations. And so if your club wants to have a, a, a another need delegate come and give a talk on something else, we have lots of different topics. Um, uh, so I thought I would start um, with thinking about your four-way test. I, I had not heard about this until I started doing uh, talks with the Rotary Clubs and and I have uh, sort of adopted it in, in my presentations, but but also sort of in uh, my professional life at least and, and you know, try to with the uh, personal life. So uh, let me just say this, what I'm gonna be presenting is a lot of data. The data is absolutely true. Data can't lie. And I am gonna do my very best to be honest and treat the data uh, fairly in my interpretation. Um, will it build goodwill, better friendships and be beneficial to all? I really hope so. And, and uh, towards that goal, I'm gonna send these slides out, but right at the top here, I have a few different links and resources. Every single thing that I'm gonna be showing you here is actually just a click away. There are people who have done all the hard work of compiling data and making it so that you can visualize uh, visualize it in terms of graphs, um, track the recovery and, uh, and the Federal Reserve, uh, St. Louis Fed uh, are both great resources for this. So if you have questions of your own and you want to answer them and you don't want to wait for somebody or, you know, find a news report, you can answer a lot of these questions uh, yourself with, you know, a, a little bit of a little bit of work. And so I hope that this uh, will uh, promote goodwill. I hope it will be beneficial to everyone and I hope to have a, a great discussion. So uh, just sort of a top line summary before I get into charts and, and figures, where are we right now? Well, uh, relative to the beginning of the pandemic, uh, consumer spending on goods, so thinking of grocery stores, retail outlets, that sort of thing, that has mostly recovered. Um, but spending on services, and it's not all services, um, but spending on particular services, you could think about things like, uh, like restaurant, uh, meals and restaurants, housekeeping, cleaning, that sort of thing. Um, that's far, far below pre-pandemic levels. Um, about a third of the small businesses that were in operation at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, and, and here I'm talking sort of middle of March when, uh, when we all found out about Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson having COVID and, and all of a sudden we all went, oh, this is serious. Uh, so middle of March is kind of the, the reference point. Um, uh, unemployment roles are uh, significantly elevated. And so I'll, I'll show you that. And um, something not captured by unemployment is we have had a dramatic decrease in the labor force. Uh, so you're only unemployed if you're looking for work. If you're not looking for work, say you're staying home to take care of your kids who aren't in school anymore, and you're not trying to find a job, you're not unemployed. Uh, you are not in the labor force. And so we've had many, many people drop out of the labor force. So I'm going to show you some stuff supporting this. So what we have here is, uh, this is a, a graph showing the um, change in all consumer spending relative to the beginning of the pandemic. So this actually goes back to, um, to January. And you can see this uh, very, very sharp decline. That sharp decline, uh, and by the way, this is uh, blue is California, Gray is the United States. Uh, the squiggles in the background that are grayed out are all the other uh, states. This uh, this decline in the beginning is um, uh, when consumers started pulling back as as we as a nation started making the determination that uh, that something was not going well. Um, I should say that it looks here like the the down on the bottom there are some major events. And so this is when uh, California shut down public schools and instituted a, a lockdown. That was really early compared to other states. A lot of states uh, either never did or, or took a week or two. But I should say that this, um, this decline in spending, regardless of lockdowns, regardless of whether public schools were closed, this is uh, something we observed in all of the states. And so I, I bring that up just to say, um, 
there is this question about how impactful the lockdowns, the government policies themselves have been. And what we've been seeing is that consumers responded to this without the government telling them that they couldn't go to restaurants, that they couldn't go to stores. Um, people got scared and pulled back spending uh, regardless of their, their state and municipal uh, regulations. Now, what we've seen uh, since this initial decline, we, we sort of bottomed out. And then in the spring, we had a, a, a recovery and people started saying, well, it, it looks like we're having a really strong recovery. And part of that was uh, related to right here in April uh, 15th, those stimulus checks started going out and expanded unemployment benefits started going out. This is after the CARES Act. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some data uh, suggesting that these programs were extremely effective, but this is some uh, sort of uh, eye test evidence that, uh, you know, giving people money made them feel a little bit more comfortable spending that money instead of hoarding it. Um, what we've seen since the end of the spring has really been a stagnation in terms of uh, consumer spending. It's just sort of inching upwards, but very, very slowly. And, um, uh, and here we are today with a, a boost from holiday shopping, but in California, spending is about 5% lower than it, it once was. That is uh, worse than uh, the US as a whole, which is closer to a 3% decline relative to the, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it has not been uh, an equal decline in all areas. So what I have here is spending broken out. It's the same idea. It's the percent change relative to the beginning. The green here is groceries. Here's where everybody was at Costco buying everything they could. So there's this huge spike in, uh, in grocery spending and grocery spending has remained elevated. This is for California. People are spending about 22% more now than they were at the beginning of the pandemic on groceries. Uh, retail sales has, uh, has largely recovered and healthcare, which took a huge dip uh, as um, uh, elective procedures were canceled and it, it became just impossible to even get in to see your doctor. Healthcare spending dipped, it's been recovering and it's still below uh, where it once was, but not, not so far. So some sectors are looking okay. Again, spending on goods is doing okay. Spending on services is, uh, is not. And so we have here uh, in the green spending at restaurants and hotels, blue is transportation, uh, red is entertainment and recreation. So this again is California and you can see that, uh, you know, after the initial decline, very little has, has changed. And so if you have a job in one of these sectors, you might, you know, you would be right to think uh, way less revenue, probably less jobs. And, and that's exactly what we're, we're gonna see in, uh, in just a minute. I want to, uh, to back up for just a second. You know, there's this question of like, why does spending matter? And I think it's intuitive that if I spend more, that's income for someone, and then they can go spend more. And so there's sort of this nice virtuous uh, cycle that plays out, unfortunately, in reverse during recessions. Um, if you were to add up all of the spending that households, that firms, that governments do, you would get a measure that we call GDP. So that's what gross domestic product is. And this is the national numbers, but 44% uh, of the value generated in the US uh, in 2019 was spending on services by households. So that's that big orange uh, chunk of the pie there. 20% was spending on goods, that's the blue, by consumers. So consumers themselves are responsible for just about two thirds of the annual spending and therefore annual income uh, uh, in the nation. And so what that means is when consumers change their spending habits, and in particular, if they're spending less on services, well, that's going to be extremely impactful because a small change in a big number is still a big number. So we care a lot about, uh, uh, you know, how much people are spending. And here's some of the, the implications. So this is a same sort of chart. This is showing relative to the beginning of the pandemic, how many small businesses are open. Uh, there was a huge decline in the beginning. That makes perfect sense. Lots of businesses had to close. There was some recovery. And then it has not recovered much since then. So since the beginning in California and in the US, uh, these average, these track each other pretty, pretty well. About a third of small businesses 
uh, are closed right now. We don't know if those are temporary closures or permanent. This is just based on whether there was uh, uh, transactions data reported. Um, but right now, a third of, uh, of small businesses are closed. And you know, for some context, uh, small businesses employ about 50% of the workforce in the United States. So a third of 50% is a, is a significant number. Here's some other implications from reduced spending. You know, when people are spending less, there's less revenue and, uh, and, and folks are laid off or fired. And so what I'm showing you here are, um, again, blue is California, the US is uh, in gray. And these are continuing claims for regular state unemployment benefits. Uh, what this means is there is always an unemployment benefits safety net. In California, if you lose your job and you've worked, you've, you, you meet certain criteria, you can apply for uh, benefits and, and you can get those for uh, up to 26 weeks is, is how long regular state benefits work. And so what this number is showing is the total stock, the total number of people who filed a claim uh, this week and last week at least. So this is the number of people who are still filing claims. And what you can see is uh, there's a huge spike in the beginning and then we've got this uh, sort of plateau through the spring and the summer, and then it starts declining. And you'd think, well, that's great, right? Because if there are less people unemployed, hopefully that means they are uh, or off the rolls. Hopefully they are finding jobs. So I, uh, I wanted to show you this federal pandemic emergency unemployment program. So this was set up as part of the CARES Act. And what it does is it provides an additional 13 weeks of benefits for people who have uh, already used up their state benefits. So I mentioned in California, you get 26 weeks. In Florida, you get 13 weeks. The point of PEUC was after you exhaust the regular program, you can hopefully switch over to this, although it's not automatic. And so what we see is there was a, a, you know, no change when the CARES Act was instituted. And then it began sort of creeping up at, uh, sort of the beginning of June. These are people who had already been on, unemployed, right? And were on the, the, the rolls. But this is sort of the first wave of uh, state benefits expiring. You can see that it gradually accumulates. So this is people who exhausted their benefits. They've been unemployed for too long and they're switching to this program. And you can see this thing sharply accelerating uh, at the same time that we have this decline. And so my conjecture, and I'll put these right next to each other so you can see them. Here's the, uh, uh, the teal one is continuing claims during the, from the regular programs. The blue is the PEUC. The, uh, the initial rise was on March 28th. I went to a uh, date subtraction addition calculator thing. I plugged that in. I said, tell me the date 26 weeks from now. Turns out it was September 26th. It's right here. So 26 weeks in California after these people expired, uh, their regular benefits expired, we start seeing PEUC trend up. And so what I'm expecting to see as we head through December is that uh, people will just, will just be switching. So what this is saying is right now, there are uh, just under 3 million Californians, uh, Californians on unemployment rolls uh, receiving benefits. There are, uh, Many people left out of that. And, and I just want to add, put in this caveat. First of all, this doesn't include the pandemic unemployment, uh, the PUA program, which covered freelancers and, uh, and other uh, independent contractors and workers who were not uh, eligible previously for unemployment benefits. Uh, I didn't put that in here because as you know, California and many places, but California especially, has had some serious uh, fraud issues with this back in September. And so when you put up the graph, uh, uh, the fraud jumps out at you. So th this is a conservative estimate, I guess is my point. This doesn't include freelancers. It also doesn't include anybody who uh, didn't, wasn't eligible for these programs and, uh, or didn't know they were and so they didn't apply or hasn't tried because they've dropped out of the labor force. So there's a lot of people not covered by these programs. So all of these people on unemployment uh, roles would suggest there might be an expansion in the uh, unemployment rate. Now, the unemployment rate literally is just how many people are either looking for work or have a job. That's our labor force. 
And then uh, you, you take that labor force and uh, the unemployment rate is how many people are looking but don't have a job relative to that. So you have to either have a job or be looking for a job to be a part of the labor force. What I'm showing you here is um, a broader measure of unemployment. This also includes people who have dropped out of the labor force because they couldn't find a job. It includes people who are working part-time for economic reasons. That's a lot of people right now, in particular, as hours have been dramatically cut. So uh, if we sort of broaden our definition of unemployment, we can see that uh, we hit a peak at almost 23% of, uh, uh, of sort of who we would expect to be working um, were out of work. It's currently much lower at 12%. But I should point out, that's an extremely high unemployment rate um, by any measure. And uh, for some context, this is a great recession. It peaked at 17.2%. Um, so our peak was bigger. We're down uh, you know, about halfway through what it was when we were recovering from the Great Recession. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that we're going to be most interested in watching moving forward is, how does this number move? Does it continue? Uh, decreasing? Do we hit back to the trend or is this going to start um, shooting back up, uh, having what we call like a double dip recession? So what's been done about this? Uh, I'm really briefly going to go through um, what the Fed and what the uh, White House and Congress have done here. So the, the Fed basically learned its lessons from the, from the Great Recession. As soon as they got wind that uh, this thing was coming, as soon as they saw that financial markets were sort of in turmoil, they stepped in. They uh, they created a, an alphabet soup of lending facilities. They slashed borrowing rates. They did everything they could to keep credit flowing where it needed to go and to make borrowing cheap to hopefully get people to continue spending. Congress and White House uh, Congress and the White House, um, they basically did the CARES Act. Now, there's a little bit more than that, but the, the big things that they did were they sent us checks, they expanded unemployment benefits, and they created a, a, a borrowing program that was essentially a grant program for small businesses who uh, promised to keep their payrolls at the, the levels that they had been before. That's the Paycheck Protection Program. I'm going to talk about all three of those programs. I should say there hasn't been anything done since the CARES Act, uh, and that was in spring. So what the Fed did, uh, first and foremost, was they injected a ton of liquidity into the system. Essentially, you can think about it as if they just turned on the printing press. They increased the supply of money. If you increase the supply of something, its price goes down. Well, the price of money is the interest rate. It's what you would give up if you held that money in your pocket. So they flooded the market with liquidity. They brought interest rates down. And that makes new debt very cheap. So many of you in here may have considered refinancing on uh, homes that you own uh, or other debt. Uh, uh, so new debt is, is very, very cheap. And that's for households, firms, the government, everyone. Uh, this is great if you're, you're trying to stimulate spending. But it's not so good if you are a saver. If you're somebody who, uh, say, is trying to uh, you know, you're on a fixed income, for example, and you're trying to earn returns off of uh, relatively uh, safe assets, well, they're not paying very much right now because there's so much liquidity out there. So, uh, so the Fed has basically made sure to keep the financial markets running, uh, but that's about all they can do. They're, they have power to lend but they don't have the power to spend. They can't mail checks in the same way that the treasury can. Um, and so that's what the treasury has done. Um, I guess I'll sort of, I'll, I'll try and go quickly through this so I can, can uh, get to all the, the rest of the good stuff. But you know, there's this question, how effective were the stimulus checks? How effective was the expanded unemployment uh, benefits? And what we have here are, um, this is change in median checking account balances for employed people. These are people who did not collect unemployment benefits in this data. And then the red is unemployed people. These are people who received unemployment benefits. That's how they got uh, designated as unemployed. Uh, you see uh, checking account balances sort of uh, relative to the beginning of the pandemic um, begin increasing. This is as people pulled back on spending. 
and they're conserving cash. And then you see the combination of uh, the sort of timing on the stimulus checks and these unemployment benefits keeps pushing up these uh, checking account balances. So what it means is people are uh, building up buffers. And this was both for unemployed and employed persons. And as soon as that $600 per week uh, supplement ended, you see a dramatic decline in the checking balances for unemployed uh, persons. You don't really see as dramatic a decline for the employed. And so what this suggests is, first of all, if the goal was to create a buffer, if we wanted to help people build up a little bit of savings, uh, these programs seem to have been very successful. Now, we also wanted people to, to spend more. We didn't just want them to save more. And so what this is, it's the same uh, um, red is unemployed and uh, gray is employed. And you can see that weekly spending relative to the to March right here, this is sort of the peak, plummets, right? So everybody stops spending or saving. And then you see a sharp increase. This is from the stimulus checks. And then you see uh, spending by the unemployed really rising back to the levels it was before. Well, that's because of these uh, additional unemployment benefits that were being given out. And as soon as those expire, you see spending decline. So if the goal was to get people spending again, these programs were very successful. You probably have heard that um, for some households, for some workers, $600 extra per week meant that they were earning more while they were unemployed than they were uh, prior to that, right? And uh, this comes from a, a New York Times article. Uh, if anyone has questions, I'll, I can talk about it later. But the point here is that uh, adding $600 or any fixed amount per week means it's proportionally larger for people who don't earn very much. And so uh, this was most um, advantageous for people who were already earning the least. And there's been this question, well, did that disincentivize people from working? And so what this is showing is the number of applications per job posting on, uh, on Glassdoor. And it's broken up by um, the implied replacement rate increase. What that means is this teal here, these are people who were earning more than uh, more than they had previously been earning on unemployment as compared to when they were working. And this is everybody else. And what you can see is that for all of these groups, regardless of what the replacement rate was, applications per vacancy was actually up on average. So what that means is if you had a job posting in say April or May, regardless of what the salary range was, on average, you had more applications than you did before the pandemic. And, and I keep saying on average, because what that suggests is there was no disincentive effect on average across all of these workers, but particular, uh, you know, individual results may vary. I know of examples of uh, workers who were say commissions based, who chose to stay on unemployment and would not go back. And, you know, I can hardly blame an Uber driver for not wanting to drive the streets. Uh, and, and give up a, a, a portion of their unemployment benefits. So these programs seem to have been tremendously successful. I'm gonna, I, I have an eye on the, on the clock. Um, so here are sort of the risks to, to recovery. The main risk is this downturn becoming a permanent one instead of just a temporary one. That'll happen as the number of long-term unemployed individuals uh, increases. That's what we're seeing right now. Short-term job losses are turning into long-term ones. Uh, and that's, that's very impactful. It's much harder to get, to get a job again when you've been out of work for a long time. Uh, another risk is an unequal recovery. So I'm real briefly going to just say, in fact, I might even just leave it here and, uh, and I can show graphs as, as people have questions so that I end on time. Um, the stock market has more than recovered. Uh, housing prices have actually accelerated. So uh, they, they are increasing at a faster rate than they were prior to the pandemic. So if you owned financial wealth, if you owned your home prior to the pandemic, your paper wealth is higher. High income earners, people earning more than $60,000 a year, a year, they have mostly kept their jobs. The job losses have been largely concentrated on low income and, and middle income, anybody earning less than 60,000. Uh, I mentioned earlier that people have been exiting the labor force. 
this has fallen uh, disproportionately on women. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, labor force participation rates for men and women, men are in red and blue is, uh, is women, they tracked each other. And then here's August and September. The fact that kids didn't go back to school meant that proportionately women were staying home to take care of the kids and exiting the labor force while participation for men has basically stagnated. Finally, I just, I, I think it's worth mentioning, especially since uh, Thanksgiving was, was so recent, um, there are more Americans facing food insecurity uh, or uh, this purple one is food insecurity with hunger is what it used to be called. So um, food insecurity as it is at an all time high right now as we head into the holiday season. So while some people, again, homeowners, those with financial wealth, high income earners seem to be doing okay, uh, maybe have even increased their, their uh, you know, slush funds, their rainy day funds during this. There are a lot of hungry people and, uh, and this, virus, this pandemic uh, recession is impacting those who are least able to absorb economic shocks um, at the moment. So uh, I think I'm a little bit over my time. Uh, I would be very happy to take any questions either in the chat or, uh, or just jumping in. My contact information is right here. So uh, please feel free to reach out to me with uh, questions uh, today or, or ever. You can also reach out to Need if you'd like, um, like us to come back. And uh, if you really liked it, you could submit a testimonial saying how, how fantastic and good looking uh, I am or, or was. So uh, thank you. And I will, uh, I'll turn it over to the, to the room, if that's okay. I guess maybe I should turn it back to the Yeah, so the actually, Brian, here. I'll just step in here. Thank you very much for this very informative and uh, database presentation. This is the end of our normal meeting time, but Brian did agree to stay on for those of you that have questions. Uh, I know some of you may have time commitment, so feel free to jump off as um, you need to, but I'll start with one question uh, in the chat, and that was just, are there particular states that have the best or worst recovery? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So what we've seen is um, uh, states that were more reliant on sort of uh, one industry have, uh, especially states that were very reliant on things like oil or tourism, have, uh, have fared relatively poorly. Uh, states that were more diverse have done relatively better. Um, the, it's not a state, but the territory that has had the, the, the most impacted spending is actually Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I guess that whole city has, has mostly been shut down. Um, so there is, there is quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of the, the economic uh, outcome for states. And this actually, I should say, uh, we're starting to get enough data at the country level that we can start making cross-national comparisons. And we're seeing that phenomenon play out on the global scale as well. The United States has actually done compared to many other countries, even though our uh, pandemic response has been, uh, by all accounts, much worse um, than most other countries. The economic damage has been uh, muted for two reasons. One, the CARES Act was about 12% of total GDP, uh, which made it like the largest uh, uh, policy enactment of, of just about any country. And number two, we have a very diverse economy. So if you're a country like Spain, for example, which is extremely reliant on tourism and nobody can travel, uh, your, your national economy tanks as well. Uh, I'm just, so what do you, uh, what do you expect regarding, regarding the vaccine rollout and I guess it's economic impact? Um, I, so the initial decline in consumer spending, I'm an information and expectations macroeconomist. I think it's really interesting to think about how people's behavior is influenced by their expectations of the future. And so I think to some extent, you could make an argument that says, well, 
well, it's not even uh, one could. If people are insured against risk, they ask, they act riskier. Um, and so if people expect a vaccine coming, it seems to be the case that, uh, that perhaps folks are already more willing to act like the vaccine is already here. So uh, to the extent, you know, if we could just isolate that effect by itself, I would expect people would be spending more because, hey, if you were conserving cash, now you're saying, well, we're going to have a vaccine here that frontline workers are getting, you know, within weeks. Uh, it's looking like the middle of next year will perhaps have been enough time for the majority or, or the amount needed to, to get the vaccine. So, you know, if you're engaged in long term planning, if you have that privilege to not just be paycheck to paycheck, but be able to engage in long term planning, you know, I think uh, I think people will go ahead and, and do the remodel and that sort of thing. So uh, certainly the vaccine is, is a positive development on the public health front um, and also on the economic front uh, through confidence. All right, another question in the chat is, um, can you share your thoughts on what would be most helpful to those impacted the most? Yeah, yeah, so um, the, uh, what people need is a, is a bridge built to get them to the middle of next year when businesses can reopen. And so what that means is if you are, you know, it, it, who are the most impacted businesses? Well, these are our restaurants, our hotels, and the people who work at them. It's not just the servers, but also the people who clean the hotels, uh, 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 the people uh, staffing airlines and other transportation measures. So on the business front, you need something like the, uh, you need a way for businesses to get loans to keep them afloat. Um, and it's the same thing with people. So those stimulus checks were tremendously impactful. Uh, as is in the slides, it allowed people to build up a buffer. It got people spending again. And uh, what would be nice to see is a more targeted version of that. So many people who did not need an additional $1,200 per person and an additional 500 you know, per dependent child living there got those checks because it was a crisis. So if we were gonna do this again, I think a more targeted version of direct transfers from, uh, from the treasury. And I think, uh, uh, I think a, excuse me, a, a more targeted version of the unemployment expansion as well. There are lots of people whose unemployment returns uh, are extremely low. Um, and, you know, it, it, it takes money. And the good news is that money is really, really cheap right now. Uh, the U.S. government can borrow at negative real rates. The nominal rate is below 1%. Inflation is, uh, you know, one and a half, two percent five percent 5% if you're talking food. Um, so that means the you know, people are in real terms paying the government for uh, the privilege of borrowing from them. So it's a it's really a good time to, you know, if you're going to need to uh, spend a lot, well, it's pretty cheap to borrow right now. All right. So this question is kind of related to what you just answered and is, do you think the newly proposed stimulus package will be enough to carry people through the impacts uh, and through the vaccine rollout? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm not... I'm not familiar enough with the details of, of the newly proposed stimulus package. I, in fact, I'm not, I'm not even entirely sure which, which one that would be. Um, uh, but, you know, sort of see my previous answer. If the new stimulus package kind of looks like the old one with some tweaks, then I would say that is a great, uh, that is a great effort. All right, and then there was a question about the federal government admitting that they've been relying on inaccurate unemployment data from the states. Uh, so how reliable is the data being used to make decisions? Yeah, th this is a really uh, great question. I, and I've gotten this, uh, gotten this before. So I'll answer it this way. Um, the, the data crunchers, the people who get the data and sort through the data are very good generally at, at what they do. Um, and so unemployment data, some of it has been extremely accurate. The regular state unemployment benefit programs, 
these were not changed. These were not new. And so the only challenges with those programs were like here in Oregon, uh, our, our computer system is from like 1995 and, and our state and many others just simply could not process the claims. But the claims themselves were, were not fraudulent. There were no issues uh, by and large with that. Where we have seen some trouble is, uh, is in particular with the PUA program, the new federal unemployment program to cover uh, gig workers and independent contractors. They rolled out this huge expansion, this huge new system and, uh, and unscrupulous folks uh, exploited it right away. A lot of those issues have been, uh, been getting resolved. Um, but I, I guess I would say the top level data like on unemployment rates, that methodology hasn't changed. They ask a representative uh, survey. It's a, 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 a sorry. They ask sixty thousand households. Basically, uh, if you've seen History of the World Part One with Mel Brooks, uh, he goes to the unemployment office. And they ask them the same questions. They just say, "Were did you work? If yes, they're done. You're employed. Uh, if not, then then there's a little more to it." And those numbers are very reliable, but you have to be asking the right question, is what I would say. So. Uh, Mostly the data has been largely accurate. There have been some issues with, uh, with a couple of the new emergency programs, and I, I didn't report on, on those today. All right, and then this is kind of related to California. There's been recent news about the prisoners scam or related to using prisoners uh, to scam the EDD system after, uh, out of money. So how did that happen? And what can be done to prevent that from happening. Yeah, I, so I, I don't uh, work in that, in that program. And so I, I don't know exactly how they exploited the vulnerabilities in the, the way it was set up to do that. I'm not sure what the plan is to, to prevent that. I think that's a really good question for the directors for, for, your, for your leadership in, in California. All right, were there any other, I'm looking at questions in the chat. Uh, did anybody else have if either raise, raise your hand in the participant list or right now, does anybody have any further questions for Brian while we have him? I think it looks like we covered all of those. Um, and I think we, uh, Alan had suggested that we invite you back in six months. Uh, to get an update on this, Brian. So you may be hearing from us again. Uh, yeah, that, thank you for a year, something like that. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd I'd love to do that. Thank you. And I saw uh, in the chat a couple of questions about getting the the PDF of these slides. I'll send that out right away. Uh, again, at the top of it, there are some links that you can go and look into a lot of these questions uh, yourself. Um, you know, you have the power. So thank you so much. This really was a pleasure for me.